Good afternoon, everyone. I, I propose we start. Thank you all for, for coming. It's very good to see so many new faces, old faces. I don't mean old like in age, but like pre-pandemic faces. Very happy to see you all again. First time that we're meeting again in, in person. It will be live streamed as, as, as well. Um, thank you also for considering uh, wearing a mask. Uh, we've, we have members in the Water Institute that might be vulnerable or have partners or children at home, so we appreciate very much you wearing a mask. Um, and I want to start by acknowledging that we're participating today also from uh, tra traditional territories of the first people. Uh, the University of Waterloo, as you know, acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldimand Tract, the land granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is centralized within our Indigenous Initiatives Office. And the Water Institute is committed to raise awareness and contribute to the calls for action of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So it's time for me to introduce our first Water Talk speaker for the full term. I'm very happy to introduce you to Professor Jacob de Boer, a former colleague for almost 10 years in Amsterdam at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. I used to make the joke that it used to be called Free University. We're not allowed to say that anymore because it sounds so cheap. It's obviously not free. Um, it's more of a liberal university. Uh, Jacob is Emeritus Professor of Environmental Chemistry and Toxicology at the Vrije Universiteit in the Netherlands. And um, he just retired. Um, earlier this year, um, and even though he's retired, he's still very, very busy. He told me on the way here that he's still working five days a week. Um, he's, among others, editor-in-chief of Chemosphere, the uh, Elsevier journal. Um, he's also a very uh, well-known public speaker in the Netherlands. His, his face is very often on, on television, and as I mentioned, our history goes back around 10 years when I just started in the institute where, where Jacob was the director for many years, I wasn't able to access my office because it was filled, the room was filled with journalists and, um, and photographers um, because Jacob com contributed to the ident identification of the poisoning of uh, the third president of the Ukraine, um, <clears throat> Viktor Yukaslin. Lensko, I hope I pronounce his name correctly, um, and um, <clears throat> his group discovered that it was dioxin that they uh, put into his food or something like that. It's the guy who had this um, disformed, um, uh, uh, mark pocked face. Um, he, he made it. Um, he was in a campaign. Uh, he used to be the prime minister, I think, of Ukraine. Then he became the, the president between 2005 and 2010. Um, and that was the way of uh, me meeting uh, the group of Jakob led in, um, in, in Amsterdam. Um, when retiring, he was also interviewed by a Dutch newspaper, and this characterizes, I think, a little bit his, uh, his, his Dutch style of managing and, and doing research. Um, the headline of the newspaper when he was interviewed was, uh, when he talked about hazardous chemicals, um, was don't make it sound better than it is. And I think you, you call it don't sugarcoat it in, 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 uh, in, in English. Um, he's, he's been an expert advisor for, for, for many international um, uh, centers and institutes, uh, authorities, uh, governments, including European Union, for example, uh, the Dutch Institute for um, Environment, Public Health, um, among others. And he's also one of the 1,000 Talents Plan, the Chinese uh, 1,000 uh, uh, Talents Plan, um, several years ago. He's published a ton of research, uh, too many to, to, to mention, in nature, science, etc. Um, he's the editor-in-chief of Chemosphere, as I mentioned, already for many years, and he's a member of the editorial board of the Handbook of en Environmental uh, Chemistry. Um, we had a talk from him already earlier today about PFAS, um, and uh, Nancy, my colleague in the Water Institute, said, oh, we're going to get more bad news stories after we had that, that presentation, that lunch seminar. Today he's going to talk about microplastics. Uh, Jacob is here to uh, be an expert advisor in, in a project led by Philippe van Capellen on microplastics, funded by NSERC. We have a one-day project review tomorrow, um, and, um, and we we're very happy that he's uh, willing to share, that Jacob is willing to share his, his uh, experiences with microplastics with us later uh, today in this talk. So, Jacob, I'm happy to hand over the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, Roy. 
Yes, thank you very much for, uh, for the much too large introduction, I would say, but uh, it is uh, very pleasant to look back, of course. And uh, yeah, uh, hello everybody, it's really nice to be here. Always love to come to Canada, a bit more contacts with, uh, with people of Environment Canada in, um, in Burlington often, but uh, it's also very nice to be here with uh, my old friend uh, Roy and seeing you. And uh, yes, the, we have spoken already uh, in uh, lunchtime uh, about uh, PFAS, and I think there's no too much concern for bad news again, because this is a little bit more technical, I think. So uh, we'll see. Uh, but still, uh, it's, we don't like to have plastics in our uh, environment. So uh, let's see where we, uh, what we're going to do. I picked out, yeah, in microplastics is very much in development. Uh, there's so much happening on the analysis side, uh, on, on alternatives or degradation, whatever. But I picked out, of course, a few things in which my lab has been active. So I would uh, uh, say a few words in general about plastics in the environment. But then I will talk uh, um, a bit more about the quality of the analysis. How can we analyze it and what are the difficulties? Uh, and we are all, I've always been interested in certified reference materials and so on, also for chemicals. So, uh, of course, plastics, also chemicals, but that is, I think, could be interesting for you. Uh, we use a method uh, uh, of, with uh, pyrolysis, pyrolysis TCMS. I will address that. And my group has done a study on plastics and human blood. And uh, that I think there's an, a couple of interesting observations from that study also. So... Uh, Let's start. Uh, let's start just with the environment. You all know because you're studying the environment uh, that we have uh, known years in which uh, the word environment was not there. Actually, the word environment was sort of coined when I started to work on it. That was with the Club of Rome, and I started in 1974. Yes, 1974. Uh, I was just over the shock of the Netherlands losing for Germany in the, in the World Cup, but nevertheless, then I could work and forget that. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, environment was attracted me because I thought it was very important. But as you see, we have had days where, you know, there was so much space, there was very little waste, and that was basically not a real problem. There was, of course, some waste, human waste, animal waste, but uh, particularly because of the space and a few people, uh, we were sort of, uh, you know, in those days, in terms of environment, was not really a problem. Of course, then we started to pollute without being, of course, we all saw it, I guess, in those years of industrial revolution, uh, certainly in the air, but apparently nobody cared initially, uh, and that uh, went on for many, many years. Uh, and yeah, uh, it was not only that we were uh, uh, making chemicals and, and making electricity and all sorts of other things, but also the growth of the world population, of course, led to the fact that all those people started to use chemicals uh, and later on plastics, but chemicals for all sorts of purposes, for transport, for whatever. So. And what I think we have forgotten is uh, that uh, there is a sort of limit to the what I always learned in the beginning uh, in those 70s, the self-purification capacity of nature. If you take a couple of uh, uh, grains of, what is it, salt or sugar, and you throw it, as my son was doing 20 years ago here, in a canal, there's nothing left. You know, there is, the nature can sort of, you know, uh, uh, clean itself very easily. But that is up to a certain limit, and those limits are related to, of course, which type of compounds you introduce in, that, uh, in the environment, and certainly to the quantities. This is Cochin in the south, very south point of uh, India, and uh, as you see, this will take a while before it's gone away if you don't do anything. Uh, India is terribly polluted, certainly with plastics, uh, and it was really awful to see such a wonderful environment, and, and this is only one picture, but I could have made hundreds of, uh, of that. Uh, there are limits, and this afternoon, uh, just referring back to the PFAS, for some compounds, like those PFAS who cannot be sort of broken down or hardly can be broken down, uh, 
the limit is maybe, you know, for the self-purification capacity of nature is almost zero. And that may also be true for plastics. Eh? But that, that limit or those limits for different compounds or contaminants, we should not forget. And I think we did. And not only industries, but particularly also uh, governments. Yeah, and then happens this, and you find uh, uh, this is in India uh, a, a newspaper, and uh, then the beach was already highly polluted. I've really walked on the beach there where there was maybe close to a meter of plastics, and then there is a monsoon, and the flood brings it back to the land again, and even more plastics. So India has a number of problems, and of course we also have, but they have it in particular, I would say. Now, chemicals are everywhere. I have worked on chemicals my whole life. I've particularly worked on persistent uh, uh, organic pollutants. The chemicals can be very nice, as you can see. They have colors, but uh, they can uh, uh, occur in different forms. Crystals, but often dissolved in either, the, you know, and when they come into the environment, the lipid of fishes or in the water, or they are there, and we have... Uh, Basically, we made our own paintings. We have developed very sophisticated methods to determine those uh, plastics, uh, those uh, chemicals in the environment. And you know, in the 70s, when I was, I'm from a, a beach town, a harbor town, when I was walking on the beach, there was already plastics. And you didn't care. You thought, OK, people, well, not so good, but uh, take it away. And while we were thinking, and I was working there on these highly sophisticated methods for chemicals, we just forgot that also for those plastics, and we didn't know at that time that it could be trans transformed into microplastics, that was actually easier, but we didn't address it. We only started to address that maybe 10, 15 years ago or so, while now we have these floating fields in the oceans and so on. It is remarkable, but uh, so we did a difficult thing, but the easy thing, at least it looks easy, uh, we sort of forget, uh, forgot, and now we have these, uh, these, these big difficulties in the environment with, uh, with all sorts of plastics. Uh, synthetic polymers uh, of different types, non-polar, medium polar, uh, uh, very polar, uh, they can also be dissolved. They're not only there as particles, uh, they can also be dissolved. Sometimes you forget that. We should not. I think we should also address that, what it is doing when it is in a bit of lipid sometimes. But it adds a factor which is for chemi chemists difficult to, uh, to adjust to, and that is the physical factor. We have uh, sometimes uh, small uh, balls or small square particles, or uh, we have fibers. We have a sort of size which we do not have with these chemicals. These chemicals are everywhere, and uh, you know, you have thousands and tens of thousands of molecules, but here we're talking about particles, and that makes the whole thing rather complicated, apparently, because we struggle to find methods, and we're still doing. First of all, we have all sorts of types of plastics for all sorts of different uh, uh, applications. Eh? As you, you see here, I won't uh, mention them all, po polypropylene, food packaging, uh, we have uh, bags, toys, building insulation for the polyurethane foam. There are so many different ones. Uh, and of course, you have that also for the traditional chemical contaminants, but still, eh? it's not just one type of. There are many different ones with all their different properties, specific gravity, sometimes below one, sometimes over one, which is very important, and so on. Now, still, we have brought it into the environment. This is our uh, King's Day, and it doesn't happen anymore. One of the things I achieve locally, but we did that as a sort of, you know, uh, happy day. Uh, there go the balloons, and they end up in birds or whatever, and we never were sort of aware of that. It's getting better with that awareness, I would say, in many places. Uh, but anyway, we did that. One day in 2014, I was walking on a, a, a harbor front on a Galapagos island and with my, two, my son and my daughter. And uh, I don't know if you can see it. It's maybe good that it's a bit fake. And I said, oh my god, we're at the Galapagos Islands and there's plastic in the harbor. And then we had a better look. We saw some movement and it's not plastic, it's a cow nose race. 
And we were all, ah, wonderful cow nose race. But at the same time, I realized that if I was a sea lion and it would have been plastic, then, you know, I would have taken it as a cow nose race. That's interesting, isn't it? So I, I went through the same experience as uh, maybe a sea lion or another uh, marine mammal. But we were happy. No plastic on the Galapagos Island until a couple of days later. Uh, we went to the beach and there was plastic. And uh, there is still plastic. We went back in 2018. And this is what you find on some beaches, not all, but some beaches all over stretches of hundreds of meters and more, uh, and all sorts of beach, beach plastic, unfortunately, there. And these guys may suffer from that also, maybe. But uh, I, I didn't study it. But I took some of these pieces to home. And uh, yeah, it's everywhere, it, really, even in those pristine areas. Now, what is the biggest problem? Eh? I, I've often asked myself, is it macro, on which I'm particularly worried, seeing the turtles and birds suffering and so on, and, and their stomachs full of plastics? Or is it micro, or is it nanoplastic? So why not ask a biologist? Isn't that an ID? Or maybe a chemist? Interesting, I find if I talk with people in the microplastics, you, you have these both communities present. It's not uh, uh, owned by the chemist. It's also not owned by the biologists, but we are together and we come from different angles and we have our different uh, methods and approaches. And while for sure we should sort of uh, cherish that a bit, huh? we should be glad that we can talk to each other from the different disciplines and maybe together we can solve the problem. Uh, which is clearly different than just chemical contamination. So that, I think, is an interesting aspect. Uh, yeah, we are exposed to many uh, of these particles so much that sometimes I think, okay, if we get so many particles in, microplastic particles, but also many other particles, would that really be a problem if it's into us, or can we cope with it? I think there is, the answer is not there yet. Uh, I'm not quite sure. As I, as I told you, I'm, I'm very worried about the environmental issues in humans. Maybe it is also. We have a small problem with the uh, nomenclature because it's a little bit different in nanotechnology, but that is a detail. Anyway, these chemists and biologists all come with their different methods. And, and now you think, of course, that as a chemist, I say that we have much more sophisticated methods, but we I'm not going to say that because I'm impressed by what the biologists also can do with all their omics techniques nowadays and so on. But this is just to show you that uh, when we started our first interlab study, there were many different methods, really many, because everybody tries, you know, you, you, you have to start on a problem, you have something in your lab and you try it out. That is basically when it starts. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's still, not very clear which are uh, the best methods. Eh? We try to sort of get it out of these interlab studies also. Uh, but there are still many. And uh, maybe we will end up also with the few to which will be standardized. Certainly not with one, because it's too complicated because of the chemical and the physical uh, nature. Now, something else which makes it very difficult, I think, is the uh, fact that, uh, you know, again, we have particles. And the effect simply of a diameter of a particle is very big. Uh, yeah, if you look to the, to the table, you think, OK, yeah, of course, eh, the, it's not, not so complicated. But still, each time I notice that people are a little bit on, uh, you know, have difficulties to, to, to think through what that means for their detection methods and so on. Take, for instance, North Sea sediment. If you look into the literature, you have about uh, 100 uh, particles on average per kilogram dry sediment. And the size range is 38 micron until about a millimeter. Of course, you know, can be outside that also, but this is about uh, what it is. If you look in the table, you see that uh, between uh, 38 uh, micron and one millimeter is already sort of four, uh, um, uh, four orders of magnitude if you trans uh, translate that into, into weight. Uh, and that is, you know, makes it immediately completely different. And therefore, I think, apart from the biologist and apart from the chemist, we need maybe a statistician. And I think we have forgotten that a little bit uh, because this whole thing of sampling and inhomogeneity, I'll come back on that in a moment. I have another slide which shows it a bit better. 
ask for a statistical approach. I think we, we cannot do without. We struggle as chemists and biologists, and we need some help there, I think. Uh, now, whatever you do in methods, eh, that you have to set up a method and you make sure that the quality is OK. And I'm going to tell you something about quality, because there were many different calls in the literature for good quality methods for microplastics. What are we actually measuring? Now, these are what we call the four pillars of QAQC, eh? quality assurance and quality control. And they're all important. So it goes, uh, uh, there is not a certain order, but we have the certified or the non-certified reference materials. There is interlab studies, proficiency tests. There is, of course, your validated method or standard method, and there is accreditation. The last one I will not address, because once you will be accredited for microplastics, we, you have everything under control, everything done. That's not where we are. Uh, it starts with sort of developing your method. You're going to validate your method, and then you need also reference materials to validate your method. That is a little bit uh, sort of chicken and egg thing, because you can't make a certified reference materials without good methods, and you can't have a good method without a certified reference material. So that is a little bit iterative, iterative process in which we are in the middle of now, I think. Uh, of course, we can organize interlab studies to compare each other's results and see who is better and not. Uh, so these three are, I think, for the moment, the ones we should uh, concentrate on. And uh, who's that? That, that's Quinn, and Quinn is our technician who is working on microplastics. And Quinn is wearing a green lab coat, as you can see. And before I say something on the green lab coat, I would like to emphasize how important good technicians are. People are working on the bench, you know, they know about all the small details, and they have to resist and give answers to all the difficult questions of the scientists. For me, in a laboratory, uh, a technician is really an essential person. And where we often meet as scientists, I always say, bring the technicians together. We have done that in the past when we were setting up the, what is called the quasi-mem machine, where we had workshop with technicians. And it was so fruitful and it was so encouraging. So that is something which I think we should, uh, we should try to organize, actually. He's wearing a green lab coat because I think of all the microplastic problems, the half of it, at least, is fibers. And fibers is even more difficult for us to, to, to measure and so on. And fibers are everywhere and, and uh, they, they, they come from all sorts of, of, of stuff, also our clothes. Uh, and it's causing blanks and background. And we said, OK, so if we find a fiber, and usually we have white lab coats, then yeah, yeah, maybe it was the lab coat. So we decided to have this strange green color because then we know if we find that strange green colored fiber in our sample is probably the lab coat. So that helps a bit to get things under control. OK, well, how do we make certified reference uh, materials? We have, of course, the NIST in the US. We have Joint Research Center in uh, Geel in Belgium, in Europe. And there's a couple of, uh, uh, of others, not in the least. Uh, you have National Research Council, I think, is also addressing that here. Uh, very good, also for shellfish toxins. Anyway, what is important is that you have a homogeneous sample. Uh, that is really important. Also, it should be stable during uh, storage, during transport, and it should be stable for years. And it should, of course, have a certified value with an uncertainty which is a sort of acceptable, let's say 20% or something like that. It's not easy to do it in general, and it's certainly not easy to do it for microplastics. Now, this is, I think, I would say this is the most important slide, so I have a good look. Uh, this is what we, because we are not already working on certified reference materials, but we, were, we, we, we plan to organize an interlab study, and then you need a material you have to send around, should also be homogeneous and sort of stable for a shorter period. Uh, I don't know if you, yeah, I think you can see it. Eh? The white particles are the plastics, and we had so many difficulties to make a homogeneous sample, because every jar or every can of what you have in an interlab study should be the same in terms of 
uh, contents for your target and analyte, in this case the microplastics. And preferably also homogeneous distrib uh, and distributed in a homogeneous way. And it's not the case. Uh, and it's not easy to, to organize that unless you maybe with slurries or whatever, but we've tried a lot. Uh, but this is not only happening when you make samples for your interlab study. This is also happening when you sample yourself in nature, in sediment, for instance. And you think, okay, I take a spoon there. Let's say it's a gram. You think, okay, I have plastics. You analyze, it's five microgram per gram. So in the whole jar, it's probably 50 micrograms per 10 gram because there was 10 gram. But that is not the case because there is nothing there. So the five gram per gram is also five gram per 10 gram, and that makes a huge difference. And I think that in the literature, we see many of these reports which are really completely biased because either too much, but if you took the spoon uh, there uh, more in, in another place, then there was nothing while there was something, and then you are also mistaken, of course. Uh, the same here. So this is, you know, homogeneity, homogeneity, homogeneity. I can't emphasize it more. It's very difficult. And here, hopefully, statisticians, I think, could help us a bit. Uh, I'm not a statistician, so therefore, I hope they can. Uh, but we have to do something with this because it's, it complicates uh, our, our sampling in particular. Uh, and it also complicates the, the efforts for the, for the reference materials. Now, uh, it's a little bit shifted here, but anyway, there are some first attempts to uh, prepare reference materials in Europe. My colleague Bert van Bavel at uh, Niva in uh, Oslo, he has at least developed something uh, which is, uh, can be used as a material for uh, water. So he has small tablets he makes, uh, he puts them in a, in a, a strip, uh, show that in the moment. I can show that now already. Uh, and then the participant should dissolve the tablet again in water. And then you have your sort of standard material. Everybody got the same pill. And he even is now uh, has uh, some attempts going on to do that for fibers, although he's still doing that by hand, which makes it all very laborious and very expensive. But these, uh, in this way, you can at least mimic uh, an, um, a reference material or a material for an interlab study for uh, microplastics. Uh, now we have been uh, we have been organizing a number of these uh, or a stepwise I should say stepwise designed uh, interlab study uh, and we are at round three at the moment I have some results they came out yesterday we had just just by chance yesterday there was a workshop on the third round of this uh, quasi mem uh, interlab study and uh, but it has not been easy but maybe just to to show that these um, uh, uh, tablets uh, can work. Uh, just a few details. We, you know, if you start from scratch, we l normally like to work with this stepwise designed interlap study. So you, you begin very simple, and we did that with pre production pellets. Just give them one of each and uh, see what, if they can identify it, can weigh it maybe. Can't be more simple. Then we had tablets where we added a few different types of, uh, of plastics. Uh, and then in later steps, so the next round, and so we, we slowly go over to either a real sediment or maybe first a sand or make it more complicated, a fish maybe, and so on. Blank tablets uh, as well. Uh, so this is what we did. This is just pre-production uh, uh, pellets, very uh, simple, uh, nothing special. And uh, if you look into the results, then you see also that uh, uh, quite some data. But uh, let's say you look, uh, we have the number of laboratories, we have the average, uh, the weight of the particles, and so on. And here, you have the relatively standard deviations, not bad. Only for polystyrene still, although only one, one piece they had to do was still some uh, deviation. It was more complicated as soon as we, particularly here, when we had tablet 10, we had different plastics in the tablet, and immediately the standard deviation went on, went, went up, sorry. Uh, why? You think, oh, three different types, no matrix, nothing, you know, just water. Then already it was difficult. Huh? This is the, a couple of years ago, but still, 
Uh, uh, so even when, because we were a bit criticized, isn't it too simple what you do in the beginning? Well, here it is. It was not too simple. OK, and here we try to find out something if people use different methods. Uh, we just indicated in green uh, when they were all sort of OK. Now, there were many people used ATR, uh, FT, uh, uh, IR, as you see, and most of them were OK, but uh, here somebody was not OK. Uh, there was only one doing micro Raman, and he was OK for everything, but you see, it's not all OK, and it, you know, you can't. Also, you cannot say one of the methods is really the best method. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you shouldn't ask me too much about that. I just inserted it because I got it yesterday. And we are now so far that we try to send out, uh, or we send out a tablet, that is this one, but also a sediment sample. Uh, and uh, I have tried to find out where they are because I couldn't uh, talk with them earlier. And look at this. This is the relative standard deviation, and this is for the tablets. And again, uh, you have the particle size fraction. Also here, the different plastics. It is not very good. It's still not very good. Around three, still one is 13.5% uh, here. So we are still struggling, which is unfortunately, that is the bad news of the day, maybe. Sorry for that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, for the sediment, it's not much better. This is on number of particles, and uh, here the standard deviations uh, and NAV means that there is no assigned value, so then the results were so, look at this. You know, we have here added uh, 49 particles, and people find between 20 or 164,000. Why? <laughs> I put 49 in, I find 164,000. You can't imagine where it happens. Uh, and we are discussing, they're discussing that at the moment in Amsterdam. Anyway, it, it is not easy, and this is then if you, instead of uh, the, the, the number of particles, you look into the concentrations, and now, okay, this one is a bit better, polyethylene, that is sort of what we hope, uh, but these ones, still not good. Uh, but, okay, for concentrations, a little bit better, maybe. That is the most optimistic quote I can give you. What I didn't address so far, but I just want to mention it because I thought it was maybe interesting for you, is uh, I don't know, but I thought you would also do quite a lot of sampling and so on. And we have very good people in the Netherlands, not in my group, but at the Rex Waterstaat, so the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the organization was uh, 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 responsible for, for uh, the quality of the water and for, for, the, for the roads and so on. Roy, you have also worked for that, I think, isn't it? Yeah. And they have fantastic machines, uh, not so cheap, but um, they are good in these things, and I thought maybe it can be of help for you. There are, uh, except from the inlet, in, inlet pipe, you have this throughput centrifuge, which are really, uh, tr sorry, flow through centrifuge, I should say. Uh, they are very sophisticated and expensive, but they, once you have it, they do a good job. They have cascades of filters uh, here which is also interesting, but the most interesting part, I think, is this. Uh, they call it sediment uh, yeah, kisten, so boxes in a way. Because if you want to catch uh, sediment particles in a, in a, in a river, for instance, uh, yeah, what to do? You have sediment traps, but sediment traps are good in lakes maybe, and they catch what is coming from above to coming down, and you catch that. But uh, Ivo, Ivo Frerix, his email is, is here. Uh, he was asked to, to inform the government on how much plastics were coming in with the river. So you, in fact, what he has to do is to do the horizontal flow. And then they develop these, these boxes, uh, which are put down at a, yeah, you can, of course, do that on, on different depths. Uh, and uh, I think it works in a way. So the, the, it's flowing through, it's catching the particles there. They had one problem, that was a rust uh, formation. But by putting some, uh, an, uh, some electrical current on the box, they are now able to avoid that. So that's also quite, quite elegant, uh, I think. Uh, it's it's, it's a, an interesting method, I think. Back to the chemical methods. I, I like this paper of Müller et al. It's 2020. And this, this paper gives an interesting overview of you know, what, what method you should choose 
dependent if you go for identification or quantification, dependent if you go for small sizes or large sizes, uh, and you see all the different methods available. Obviously, if you have either small or large size, uh, but you want to do identification of the polymer, the microscope is not the best thing to have, but it is very good when you go for quantification or total particle number, uh, for instance. And so you can sort of pick out all the different methods. It's a nice overview, and you have to make your choice, and again, you probably have to select at least two different methods. Huh? General recommendation for if you go for mass, thermoanalytical or chemical methods are, are uh, probably suitable. suitable. And uh, for if you go for number of particles, then it's normally the spectroscopic uh, methods which are uh, suitable. Now, a few words on pyrolysis, GCMS, just because we use it, not because, it, because it would be the best method maybe, but it is an interesting method. Um, the, the, the principle is very simple. It's actually a normal GC with a mass spec if you want, and normally you need that, of course, uh, here. Uh, and then you have uh, the possibility to, uh, with a small cup, to uh, bring that in this uh, cabinet uh, here. Uh, there is only helium, so there's no oxygen, there's no burning process. And then you do a sort of, no you bring it in, uh, and you do a normal chromatography run. Uh, then you, uh, so you withdraw the cup again and you bring it in again, and then you heat it up to maybe five or 600 degrees, and then it's completely pyrolyzed, and you do another run again. And what you get then is uh, a normal chromatogram and a pyrogram. And the normal chromatogram tells you if there are other compounds on, in or on the plastic. It can be phthalates, for instance, but it could also be all sorts of uh, contaminants, uh, which are uh, then shown in the chromatogram, and, and, and you can do the mass specs uh, of it. You see the cups here, which are pretty small. Uh, and then, of course, when you do the pyrogram, then the whole plastic falls apart, and you can see all the different parts of the, uh, uh, the different uh, polymers. Conditions, well, first part is then relatively simple. This is what you do with a, a normal GC analysis. Uh, a normal etulant uh, machine, but the, uh, the, the, the pyrolyzer unit uh, we have is called the double shot uh, uh, mode. Uh, it's also having an auto sampler, uh, and the double shot is obviously referring to this, you know, regular chromatogram and the, and the pyrogram. So you retreat the sample and then uh, you do it again, but then you heat up to much higher temperatures. Uh, 600 degrees, but that depends eh, if it should be 600 or not, and it depends because this is sometimes happening. Uh, there is not one type of plastics normally in your sample, can be, but often there are different types, and particularly when you have a combination with uh, polyphenyl chloride, then you run into trouble because the polyvinyl chloride, the HCl, is often reacting, and it gets you fragments which suggest that you have a certain polymer which you really do not have. Uh, I, I, I won't go in detail here, because there's, there's many good papers, also pre-microplastic era, I would say, because in the industry, of course, they have often uh, done this, identifying polymers, and there, there, are very, there are many interesting papers, but you have to be very careful here. So uh, as soon as you have the PVC, and it is also for some other combinations, you can, you can get confused and you do misinterpretations. Uh, there are solutions. The first of all is then, as soon as you see benzoic acid, that is a sort of marker that something is going on, which likely you should not have, actually, or, or preferably you should not have. That is a, a sign for undesirable reactions. You can vary the pyrolysis temperature. I mentioned six, 600 degrees, but sometimes, like for polystyrene, it's much better to go to 500, and uh, while for the others, it's better to go to 700. So that means you have to do different runs, but okay, you can automate it and uh, better do two runs and have proper results than one ending up with rubbish, isn't it? Uh, you can also vary simply, the, what you always can do, the polarity of your GC column for some, it's a combination, it's better than for others. 
uh, yeah, you can absolutely exclude monitoring of some specific markers. Uh, and there are also possibilities to do an, uh, a pyrolysis in a reactive mode. Won't go into details now, but that there, so there are options to avoid that. Uh, uh, and you can still work with it. So, uh, but it's good to be aware of it because otherwise you're soon lost. So we have pros and cons of the pyrolysis uh, approach. We have uh, a, a relatively easy sample preparation. It's widely applicable. Uh, we can do identification and also sort of quantification. It's good for complex mixtures, solid and liquid samples, uh, equally good. Automation is fine, you get a lot of information, but at the same time we see it's destructive, so you can do it only once. Uh, it's not suitable for polar compounds. Uh, quantification, not that easy. There is much fragmentation. Spectra are sometimes difficult to interpret. Uh, your <coughs> mass spectra, uh, you have this risk of undesired reactions and standardization may really be necessary, otherwise, you know, the one time you do something else than the other time. Now, that was on pyrolysis GC, and the last part uh, will be on the yeah, discovery uh, and quantification of plastic particles, uh, particle pollution in human blood. It was done by people in my uh, group, uh, led by Heather Leslie and uh, also by Maria Lamore. Uh, and uh, it is an interesting paper, because if you read the paper, I think they've done it in the proper way because after long discussions, and I was part of it sometimes in the department, we had a, a long struggle if we would really publish it or not. We all had the idea that we, we found the plastic particles in human blood, but you can see at the results that are, you can easily also have some doubts. Uh, and I think it's written in a way that we also forwarded those, those doubts we had ourselves. Uh, so, uh, it's sort of, you know, take it for what it is. Uh, but we thought it was good to, to share that information. So here are some things we did. It was 22 samples. Uh, then, of course, when you take blood from people, you have a needle. And that immediately means that, you know, you can't see larger particles than go through the needle. You shouldn't forget that. It looks quite big, but still. Uh, and, yeah, some other information here. Uh, there was a cleanup, which is not very short thawing. There was denaturation of the proteins, of course, shaking, filtering, and so on. And finally, the filter was transferred after some further treatment to and drying to your uh, pyrolysis cup. Here you see some, uh, some different ions and uh, retention times for the different uh, polymers. That was basically not a very big problem. Blanks were a bit of a problem. So all the data you will see were corrected for the blanks. We did a lot of repetitions for the blanks and it was the best as we could get. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that you always have to work in a clean room, but blanks is really an issue, of course, for microplastics and is not, not very easy to, uh, to, to stay away from, from all sorts of influences outside your sample. Limits of detection, uh, the LOD and the LOQ, of course, a factor of three difference. And here you see some results. Now, what the problem was with the results is that, you know, here are the samples, and the A and B are duplicates, and they're not very good. And this was the, the, the main problem. And they're all circled where they're not very good, but you can easily find some others. There are some which are not too bad. But take 12A, the, for one plastic 6.2, you do it again. And then you're between, if you see an asterisk, it's between LOD and LOQ. Here again, a factor 4. Here, nothing, basically, and 1.2. What to do with that information? And uh, I was actually very hesitating to, to let this be published. But on the other hand, it's also a sort of discussion paper. If you put it in a graph, you see the same thing. Uh, a and B are duplicates. And uh, particularly in the beginning, each time you see one duplicate with a positive score, and then the next one, there was nothing, and so on, and so on. It's a bit better when the levels are higher, but still the differences take 12 A and B. 13 A and B are very big. Uh, 
Nevertheless, everything pointed to the presence, I've, I've seen all the pictures, everything pointed to the presence of microplastics in blood because it was absolutely very different from you know, the, the blanks and, and uh, what have you. So uh, is it also in homogeneity? So is the plastics in the blood samples also inhomogeneously distributed? So that we take a sample and sometimes there is a bit and sometimes there isn't. This is what we wondered and, and asked ourselves, and I think there is no answer yet. Uh, I'm coming to an end. I think it's very clear, at least in our part, but maybe I will hear from you and see tomorrow that you are much further. Uh, we are still in development. Uh, particle county mass-based methods, they're complementary. I think we will need them for both sides. I think we have forgot a bit, maybe, but let's discuss that. But we need statistical knowledge to solve these problems of inhomogeneity. And then I have a few conclusions on the pyrolysis, which interesting technique, helpful, but very vulnerable also, particularly for misinterpretation. So if you do it, be very careful and optimize. And that is not a matter of a couple of days, but rather a couple of months, I would say. But whichever method you use, ensure your QA, QC is OK. Uh, finally, EuroQ Charm is the project which is still running. There are a few other projects. I'm happy in the meeting tomorrow to mention that. Uh, also starting now, there is a lot of research money in Europe spent on microplastics, I can tell you. And it would maybe be good to have more interaction between both sides of the ocean. I would like to encourage that. Uh, this project is led by Bert van Bavel from uh, NIVA. And this is uh, a photo of the first workshop and uh, the acknowledgments for the different colleagues, either in the FU or at NILU or at Quasimem. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob. We have time for a couple of questions. Philippe. Thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> I won't say whether we're ahead or behind, but uh, you'll see tomorrow. OK. Uh, for your replicates, uh, or your duplicates for the blood samples, so if you have one A, one B, are those two different draws of blood? Or is it from the same sample twice? No, it was uh, a, a one sample, and then uh, sort of take, and then, uh, yeah. Uh, so two it. duplicates, yeah. but then the duplicates were also run several times. Uh, so the cups were, were run different times or filled. Okay. So it was, it's a little bit more than a duplicate, but still. OK. Yeah. Did you see any trends with um, the, the participants who gave blood? No, no. we really couldn't. No. no, no. So one more question ah. uh, about the reference materials. Because um, um, so far as I understand, the reference materials that has been worked on is essentially pure yeah. plastics that are yeah. then basically distributed between labs and then yeah. put in different matrices. Yeah. Uh, but that's still probably fairly far away from the real, micro, real microplastics in the environment. Yeah. Is there also thought about essentially creating reference materials that would be from the environment directly? Now, the Joint Research Center in Geel is now working on a, a certified reference material for microplastics in water. So, and they work a little bit in the same way, not with tablets, but something similar with, with sodium chloride and sort of, but they're not there yet. The lady who's doing that was there yesterday, he said, uh, somebody asked, so uh, how much time? And uh, yeah, I thought it was a bit too pessimistic, but she said everything between three months and five years, which is not very helpful. Uh, <laughs> I think they are closer than what she said, but, but apparently there are still some problems there. Thank you for the talk. Very nice. I have a, a question in my mind. I want to ask you for comments. Uh -huh. You see, microplastic is a waste. Meanwhile, the micro-sized plastic are used as a product. For people like me who do material research, we study, we analyze micro size plastic, the analysis is not an issue. But here I see it's surprising to see the variation from lab to lab. So 
what in my mind I'm standing is the problem is with the sourcing and the collection of microplastic. But the analysis itself may not be an issue. How do you think? <laughs> yeah, if I understood you right, you say that the problem is particularly in the sampling part. In the, in the sourcing, the source of microplastic and the collection, how do we collect it? The way we collect it. Yeah. That, yeah. Now, for sure, it's in the way we collect it. That I think I, I hope I made that clear. I think there is, that is very critical how we take the samples, where we take the samples. And you know, if you have 20, uh, like in the North Sea sediments, 20 particles on a kilogram, and you want to fill you know, a small jar of 10 grams, you're left with less than one particle. and <laughs> You can't use that. Then you can say, OK, but I put in more. But then it's not realistic. So what to do? Yeah, or send around a kilogram to each, but uh, that's also something. Huh? And then still, 20 uh, particles in a kilogram and try to do this with homogeneous is not easy. So there's all that sort of difficulties you, you run into. The levels are, yeah, you can't say low because we consider it as a problem, but 20, 20 particles in a kilogram for analysis is very low and difficult to handle. So it's particularly the way we uh, uh, collect it and yeah, about the source. Yeah, they, are, they vary a lot, of course. Eh? We have the pre-production particle, which is normally larger. Uh, but of course, also the degradation for macroplastics. And yeah, it's difficult to say something about that, I think. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. And I just want to uh, disclose I know nothing about this topic, neither I'm a chemist. Uh, I, I have a little bit of ideas. So I'm just curiosity question. So I understand that you have problems with microplastic, which doesn't really dissolve, say, let's say, in water. But we had other things before, bad stuff, let's say, uh, that was also the same thing, like whether it's silver or other things that don't dissolve. So why didn't this kind of study is done already? You mean with other type of particles, yeah. maybe? so it's not like new. No. I, can you mention an example, maybe? No, I mean, there are things easy. that are not easily dissolved. And most of the things, when no. you say homogeneity, it comes from dissolved. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, but things that are not dissolved, I, I'm not a chemist, so I'm saying like silver, for example. Uh -huh. That wouldn't have been easily uh, studied either. I mean, it's not an easy way to extrapolate from one gram to another gram. No, no, no. But we are, at least as chemists, very much used to, to uh, work at the molecular level. And, and, you know, and this is very different, and that is why we got stuck as a chemist, but there may be other people who are just good in that, I don't know. But we, I haven't done much with other particles, although they may have been there. But uh, yeah, we are very much used to, you know, and then you have thousands of molecules, and it's amazing to see how much we have achieved in sensitivity with our instruments over the period I have worked. We have, uh, what was it? Uh, a, I think six or seven orders of magnitude we've gone down, you know, from I started to work with milligram per kilogram, we are now at the, at the picogram. So it's amazing what we have been doing, but it was always on the molecular level. And now we have these particles which look very easy and suddenly we are stuck. And I, I, I have no example of something which happened before in the same way. But if you have, it would be interesting. Yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's very, it's, it's fascinating. I, I, I have a question about the recovery for your G GC. So I wonder like if you uh, spike some plastic and then uh, test the standard. I, I'm curious what is the number in terms of recovery. The recovery, if you do pyrolysis, you mean? Uh, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, that is sort of OK. I have no data here, I think, but that that was not one of the big issues. The blanks were much more a problem than, than the recovery. So that is sort of OK, although we don't have labeled standards or so yet, I think, for most of the plastics. But uh, what we could see is that we, we were not worried about that. OK, oh, that's nice. I mean, like, uh, I, I, I'm a PhD student working on microplastic. Like, I see uh, when I use some other method, like uh, micro FTR, when, when yeah. we spike some sample and yeah. use counting to recover, test the recovery when the size goes down, usually the, the recovery goes below than 50% or even 30%. Okay. That's quite a, a problem. If I know that GC has a, such a high recovery, yeah. that's a quite promising oh, yeah. technology. Oh, it's certainly higher, yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's awesome, yeah. I think. Okay, okay. Uh, 
Thank you for that very interesting presentation. <clears throat> My question kind of follows up on that. If you're using GC pyrolysis, is there, <clears throat> is there any value in having an internal standard or a surrogate in the analysis? I think it would. I think it would. It's always better to have that, I think. And uh, uh, it's also for the plastics, maybe we can do something with uh, labeled uh, standards. And that would always be helpful, but sometimes, or yeah, if, if you have no label standards, it's always, you know, you get the difference between your internal standard and your target. But yeah, uh, of course, it would always be better. And when you have an MS, it's, uh, it's something you would like to do, yeah. Mm, I agree, yeah. You have one more question? Thank you for the talk. Uh, in your pyrolysis, you just burn in the plastic, right? We just burn in that, and then what use? What useful product out of it? You just just yeah, it's creating. it's not burning. Eh? It's it's not. There is no oxygen, so it's not burning. It's heating until it falls then apart. Then, what, what's the product uh, afterwards? Uh, the product is is uh, fragments, and and uh, so you get a, you know, you, it's broken down into pieces like what you have in a moss pack actually also. And you can see that in the MOS spec. Okay, so it's not completely into uh, only uh, carbon or so. It, it, it depends very much of your temperature, of course. The okay. higher you get, the smaller your fragments. Can you reuse it after you do the pyrolysis? No, no you can't reuse it. That's, uh, no. it's, uh, That's it's, the limitation, uh, right? One off. Yeah. That's a pity. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. One last question. Thank you very much for the presentation. I was just wondering, I know that with microplastics in general, one of the problems with sampling in particular is that people have different cutoffs for their lower bound. And I was wondering, of course, as you go smaller and smaller, it's so much more difficult to work yes. with. And I was wondering where you typically have your cutoff line. No, yeah, I don't think we have that sort of set in our laboratory. It depends very much uh, of uh, first the method, of course, because we also work with FTIR sometimes, and then it's different again. And it, it depends also of your of your target. So we have no sort of fixed value. It's a bit method uh, method uh, dependent. But you see, and certainly you see that with interlab studies, where you know we think, okay, we we make a sample with uh, let's say uh, 0 0.1 uh, micron or so that the reason that some people find so many more particles than we have added is that they look have, have a much lower cutoff and apparently find something which was there what we as organizers couldn't see. I mean, those things happen, and that confuse, gives a lot of confusion. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Great. Let's give Jacob another uh, round of applause, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the question.